Welcome. My name is Lieutenant Commander Megan Hayden, and I'm a nurse consultant in the Division of Nursing Homes in the Quality, Safety, and Oversight Group at CMS. Today, I am discussing the significant changes to the infection control portion of the nursing home interpretive guidance. I will discuss the following four F tags that are found under the infection control regulatory grouping. They are F880, F881, F882, and F883. I will also discuss the infection preventionist or IP's role on the quality assessment and assurance or QAA committee at F868. To begin, F tag 880 has added information related to water management. Facilities must be able to demonstrate its measures to minimize the risk of Legionella and other opportunistic waterborne pathogen outbreaks in building water systems. An example of such is a documented water management program. A facility must use nationally accepted standards, for example, ASHRAE, formerly the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and or the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, to minimize the risk of waterborne pathogens. Current standards recommend the following, and surveyors should determine through interview or record review as necessary whether the facility has Assess the building water system to identify where opportunistic waterborne pathogens could grow and spread. For example, facilities may have a description of the building water system using text and flow diagrams. Whether the facility has measures in place to prevent the growth of opportunistic waterborne pathogens, also known as control measures, and how the facility will monitor them. For example, control measures can include visible inspections, use of disinfectant, and or temperature control that may require mixing valves to prevent scalding. Monitoring may include testing protocols for control measures, acceptable ranges of control measures, and documenting results of testing. Additionally, the facility should have established ways to intervene when their control limits are not met. Through interview with the infection preventionist and record review, surveyors should determine whether the facility has had a resident with legionellosis since the last recertification survey. Surveyors should determine what actions the facility took in response to the identified case in the facility. The state survey agency should work with local state public health authorities, if possible, to determine if the water management was inadequate to prevent the growth of Legionella or other opportunistic waterborne pathogens, and whether the facility implemented adequate prevention and control measures once the issue was identified. Let's move on to to updates with the Antibiotic Stewardship Program, or ASP, at TAG F881, starting with the language around feedback to prescribing practitioners. We revise the requirement to provide feedback to prescribing practitioners regarding antibiotic resistance data, their antibiotic use, and their compliance with facility antibiotic use protocol. While providing feedback to prescribing practitioners is recommended to improve prescribing practices and resident outcomes, it is no longer required as an element for compliance with F881. If there are concerns with the ASP, surveyors must include at least one resident on an antibiotic in the resident sample to assess whether the resident is being prescribed an antibiotic unnecessarily and whether there were any negative outcomes 
such as an adverse drug event. Instances of prescribing antibiotics unnecessarily should be cited at F883.45D, which is F tag 757. These findings may support citing F881 as well, in which case the surveyor must also show that the facility is not implementing part or all of the AFP. Now, I will discuss the infection preventionist role found under the infection control regulatory grouping at F tag 882. We will also discuss the infection preventionist role on the Quality Assessment and Assurance, or QAA, committee at F868. First, the regulatory language states that the IP is responsible for the Infection Prevention and Control Program, or IPCP. This includes assessing, developing, implementing, monitoring, and managing the IPCP. This does not mean that the IP cannot or should not collaborate with other staff. For example, under F881, we state that development of the antibiotic stewardship program should include leadership support and participation of the medical director, consulting pharmacists, and nursing and administrative leadership. While a well-running IPCP is a team effort, the IP is responsible for making sure the program meets regulatory requirements. Surveyors should determine that the facility designated one or more individuals as the infection preventionists who are responsible for the facility's IPCP. Now that we have discussed some of the responsibilities of the IP, let's turn to some of the requirements of the position. The regulation states that the IP must be professionally trained in nursing, medical technology, microbiology, epidemiology, or other related fields. The facility must provide documentation of the IP's primary professional training. A, pro a professionally trained nurse must have earned a certificate, degree, or diploma in nursing. If the facility employs a medical technologist as the IP, then the facility must provide evidence of an associate's degree or higher in medical technology or clinical laboratory science. If the facility employs a microbiologist or epidemiologist as the IP, then the facility must provide evidence of a bachelor's degree or higher and microbiology or epidemiology, since this is the entry level degree for these fields. Examples of other related fields of training that are appropriate for the role of an IP include physicians, pharmacists, and physicians' assistants. And the facility must show the IP's completion of this training. At section 48380B3, the language states that the IP must work at least part-time at the facility. There is not a specified number of hours the IP must work. The reason for this is that hours per week can vary greatly based on the facility and its resident population. Therefore, the amount of time required to fulfill the role should be determined by the facility assessment conducted according to section 48370E to determine the staff hours it needs for its IPCP. As part of this, a nursing home should consider resident census as well as resident characteristics and the complexity of the healthcare services it offers in determining the amount of IP hours needed. The IP must have the time necessary to properly assess, develop, implement, monitor, and manage the IPCP for the facility, address training requirements, and participate on the QAA committee. The surveyor should perform interviews to determine if the IP has adequate time to perform the role. The second part of the requirement states that the IP must work 
at the facility. This does mean that the IP must physically work on site at the facility and not at a separate location such as a corporate office. If you think about it, it is hard to manage an IPCP to include infection control practices such as hand hygiene, environmental cleaning and disinfection, and implementation of transmission-based precautions if you are not on site. Therefore, surveyors should interview the IP and other facility staff to determine where work is performed. Next, I want to review the specialized training requirement. The specialized training in infection prevention and control must be beyond the initial professional training or education previously mentioned. Infection prevention and control training must be sufficient to perform the role of the IP, and the facility must provide evidence of completion of the specialized training to the surveyor. For example, this may include a certificate of training. Well, I think that completes the discussion of the IP qualifications. Let's turn to the IP's participation on the QAA committee. The IP must be a participant on the facility's QAA committee and report on the IPCP and on incidents for example, healthcare associated infections identified under the program. Reporting may include, but is not limited to, facility process and outcome surveillance, occupational communicable diseases, for example, influenza, and the antibiotic stewardship program related to antibiotic use and resistance data. In order to be considered an active participant, the IP should attend each QAA meeting. If the IP cannot attend, another staff member should report on his or her behalf. The IP's participation on the QAA committee is reviewed for each recertification survey under the QAA and QAPI plan pathway. If the surveyor finds a deficiency, then the surveyor would cite at tag F868. Since IP participation was mentioned under the regulatory language at both section 483.80c and section 483.75g, we chose F868 as the logical place to include reviewing and citing for this requirement. Lastly, let's discuss revised language under tag F883. On November 22nd, 2019, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, released updated recommendations on the use of 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV13, among adults aged greater than or equal to 65 years. ACIP states that PCV13 vaccination is no longer routinely recommended for all adults aged greater than or equal to 65 years. Instead, shared clinical decision-making for PCV13 use is recommended for these individuals who do not have an immunocompromising condition, cerebrospinal fluid leak, or cochlear implant, and who have not previously received PCV13. Facilities must follow the ACIP recommendations for vaccines, and surveyors should review residents' medical records for pneumococcal immunization status per ACIP recommendations and remain vigilant on ACIP updates to recommendations. Congratulations, you have successfully completed this section of the training. If you have questions about this training, please send them to the DNH triage mailbox at dnh underscore triage team at cms.hhs.gov. Thank you for your continued effort towards our shared goal in providing quality care to America's nursing home residents.